Salo for Lava, this is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. I'm Susanna Susuiki. Coming up, a petition on Tonga is urging the removal of its newly appointed Chief Justice. Also, we know that Pacific peoples are less likely to complain to Broadcasting Standards Authority. A new study shows diverse audiences in New Zealand are avoiding media, but why? And... To be honest, I've only heard of mental health when I came to New Zealand. And as sad as that sounds, it was never introduced into our home. How one Samoan woman is breaking down barriers for youth in Hawke's Bay. A group of lawyers in Tonga have petitioned the King to remove newly appointed Chief Justice Malcolm Bishop because of his sexuality. Sodomy is listed as a criminal act in the Kingdom. The petition, which RNZ Pacific has obtained, says because Mr Bishop lived in a sodomist relationship with his partner for 51 years, it's wrong for him to come to Tonga as Chief Justice. Caleb Fotheringham has more. The Tonga Law Society president is trying to distance the organisation from the petition which is attempting to oust Mr Bishop from his post. Lopeti Senetuli says the lawyers who kicked the petition into motion are acting independently, not in conjunction with the Law Society. That is not an official petition of the Tonga Law Society. It is a petition by members of the Tonga Law Society, but it is not officially sanctioned by the, the Law Society's Executive Council. Have you signed the petition? No, quite clearly not. Mr Sinituli says he doesn't know how many signatures the petition has, but it was planned to be handed in last Friday. He says one of the people leading it is prominent local lawyer William Clive Edwards. Sodomy is listed as a criminal act in the country. RNZ's Pacific Tonga correspondent Kalafi Moala says some people view the appointment of the new Chief Justice as a mockery of the legal system. He says a protest march is planned in an attempt to get the king to revoke the appointment. In order to keep a check on the balance of power, the king is authorised to appoint judges of Tonga and the police commissioner, the anti-corruption commissioner and the attorney general. And the king has councils such as the judiciary panel and the privy council to advise him on his appointments. But the final decision... RNZ Pacific has reached out to Mr Edwards for comment. Social media is the most cited platform for seeing offensive material, according to New Zealand's Pacific, Māori, Asian and Muslim communities. The Broadcasting Standards Authority report found around a third of Māori, Pacifica and Muslim groups reported reading, seeing or hearing offensive, discriminatory or controversial views shared publicly in the past six months. Pacifica had the highest response rate to experiencing harmful content compared to others, but when it comes to laying a formal BSA complaint, respondents say they don't because it goes against their culture. Alicia Foon spoke with the BSA's chief executive, Stacey Wood, for more. We knew that these harms were out there, that these experiences were happening, but obviously some pretty sobering stuff in there. And the reason that we wanted to commission this research to begin with is because we know that uh, Pacific peoples as well as Māori, Asian and Muslim New Zealanders are less likely to complain to the Broadcasting Standards Authority when they encounter harmful content. So rather than uh, wait for people to come to us, which we know they're less likely to do, uh, we thought we'd go out there and find out what they're experiencing. So I guess um, what would you like people to know and also the government to know when it comes to media information and the way these audiences are portrayed on these different platforms? Do you think news media are part of the problem or are you wanting to kind of raise awareness about the way that social media isn't really safely policed and and needs to be improved? Uh, Although social media was clearly the the front runner for the platforms where people are experiencing the most harm, there was still a substantial number of people who said that they were switching off TV and radio because of the negative content that they were seeing. And although we uphold only a small percentage of the complaints that come to us, um, about two thirds of those of the total complaints we receive are still about news and current affairs programming. 
So I think um, what our uphold rates probably show is news media are generally doing a good job of upholding broadcasting standards, but there's a broader sort of societal issue that we need to tackle, which is around social cohesion and kindness, <laughs> to, to sound woke for a second. Uh, and I think that social media is uh, a big problem because of the lack of re regulation. Um, we've been calling uh, for regulatory reform for 15 years now uh, because our act was written in a time when the internet barely existed. So while we are champions of freedom of expression and we believe that people should be free to express themselves as long as it doesn't, it, it's not outweighed by the harm that it's causing, uh, we do think that uh, the government needs to consider whether the online spaces do need to be more regulated because at the moment it, there's nothing there. Um, there's no one to complain to. There's nothing unless you are publishing terrorist or child sexual abuse material. <laughs> um, there's nothing that anyone can do to, to stop what's said online. Yeah, that's quite a big ask for from any government. And we, we're seeing what's happening in the United States uh, with, you know, Facebook lawsuits and, and that sort of thing. So how would the New Zealand government police social media platforms that are based in the states when their own country can't even do that? Yeah, it's a big ask. Uh, and it's, it's not something I think the New Zealand government should be expected to shoulder on its own. Uh, but it, it is heartening to see uh, the progress that the EU and America and other countries that do have more influence uh, are making. And really, um, a lot of what it comes down to is asking the social media platforms to do what they say they're doing in their terms and conditions. So if they can use algorithms to target people specifically with marketing content they think is going to appeal to them, to um, give them content they think they're going to want to see, they should be able to use those same algorithms to shut down harmful content or to direct people away from harmful content that they know is serving no social good. Yeah. When it comes to harmful content, what were some of the real life examples that were given over that period? Yeah, so there, um, there was a range of uh, different kinds of content and um, the categories were things like uh, portraying some ethnic groups in a derogatory way, uh, spreading misinformation that reinforces negative stereotypes, hate speech, uh, unbalanced reporting. And some of the specific examples that were mentioned were uh, stereotypes about uh, Maori and Pacific peoples, uh, for instance, saying they're all on a benefit. Uh, misinformation, so untrue messages like migrants are coming to take all their jobs, um, and sensationalising issues like uh, there was well, a little while ago there was reporting on uh, spaces at universities that were specifically for Maori and Pacific peoples and the way that that was reported. So those were some of the, the specific examples that respondents brought up uh, in the focus sessions. The report highlights some pretty big and complicated issues that aren't going to be solved overnight. Uh, there are some obvious things that we can do to uh, make our processes more accessible to people, uh, but there's a limit to what we can do within the current legislation. And I think the findings of this report support what we've been calling for in the sense that we need a modern act, modern regulations that are that reflect reflect how people are consuming media now, um, that deals with the internet, that considers whether social media should be regulated and doesn't just limit um, our jurisdiction to linear television and radio. Children in Vanuatu will soon be able to see themselves in new books written by local writers. Save the Children launched its Library for All project, which is designed to provide children across Vanuatu with culturally relevant books. Writing workshops will be held across the country where at least 100 new books will be written. The organization's country director, Polly Banks, told Caleb Fotheringham 8,000 books are going to be sent to remote schools. Our Library for All project is going to provide children with a chance to read local stories that reflect their own identity and their own experience of the world. We've received really generous funding from the Church of Latter-day Saints to the value of 450000 New Zealand dollars. And with that funding and with Library for All, which is a social enterprise of Save the Children, we will be creating a library of 100 new books and they will be written entirely by local community members. So we'll be working with community members from across Vanuatu to host writers' workshops 
and we'll be collecting the stories that represent their experience as locals of living in Vanuatu so that children at the other end of the publishing experience when these books are published and printed can pick up books that really mirror their own world and their own experience of the world. You can imagine a child in Vanuatu instead picking up a book about Paddington Bear living in London and the story, although it provides an imaginative window to a world far, far beyond, these books don't create a sense of, of their own identity. So it's important for children to have access to both types of books, books that spark imagination and show them a world far away, but also equally important to have books that mirror their own experience and identity. Why is it so important that children read books that, as you said, mirror their own experience and identity? I suppose we can't be what we can't see and having community members reflect on their own experience of the world helps children to create role modelling and also is proven to improve their own literacy journey. Here in Vanuatu, the latest data that came from the Pacific Islands Literacy and Numeracy Assessment showed that 79% of Year 4 students in Vanuatu aren't meeting the regional minimal expected standard in reading. And look, there's many reasons why children aren't able to read to the level that they should, but one of those reasons is the lack of reading books that are available. And all of the science tells us that it's important not just to have those, those window books, but also books that mirror their own world. It's pretty cool that Save the Children is lining up local writers to write these books. So my understanding from what you've told me is that you don't know what these books are going to contain yet. It's just going to be from local writers about local issues. Yeah, exactly. So it'll be the creativity of local writers. We certainly have themes that we support writers through those workshops to speak to. So for example, in Vanuatu, the country is one of the most vulnerable in the world to climate-induced disasters. And so, of course, we speak about those themes when we're hosting writers' workshops and some other key themes around health and education, sport, family time. But indeed, it's the imagination of, of community members that will come to the forefront with the creation of these stories and really localised, unique stories. I worked on a Library for All project a number of years ago in the Solomon Islands and the specificity that one particular language group was able to bring to a book that they created around a particular rock where spiritual ceremonies occur meant that they could create this story that for future generations, children will be able to read an imaginative retelling of a story about this important spiritual rock in their community on Makira in the Solomon Islands. And that sort of specificity you could never find in a book that's sold in an international bookshop for children growing up here in Vanuatu or the Solomon Islands. In the Solomon Islands as well, and it's cool that you've already had experience during this process, did you find the kids went and were gravitated to the books written by the local writers as opposed to, you know, what you mentioned before, Paddington Bear? Do the kids go for the local books? Very much so. And something that's really special about the Library for All model is that certainly the books will be printed and we'll be sending 8,000 copies of these books in the first instance out to really remote schools. But the books are also loaded onto a free reading app so they can be downloaded and accessed by anyone in the world, in fact. But you can filter it down to which country you want to access a book collection from. And for the Solomon Islands book collection, for example, you can download the Library for All app and find 350 books that have been written by local community members across the Solomon Islands. And in the future, the same will exist with this book collection in Vanuatu. The project, which just started, will take 14 months until books are in the hands of children. The reigning Miss Samoa for Afafine is on a mission to break down barriers for youth in Hawke's Bay, Aotearoa. And Nikayo travels back and forth to Samoa, supporting and pushing various cultural programs. One in particular is her own baby, otherwise known as the Lumanai Siva Academy. Grace Viva Ai has more. (laughs) 
the Lumanae project is to showcase the leadership and talents of Fafafina individuals, educate the young youth and about their heritage, and celebrate their unique identity through cultural arts and performances. Miss Kyle says the growing number of cultural academies in Auckland demotivated her to establish her initiative. The Lumanae Siva Academy was inspired from Siva Academies across New Zealand. I saw that this was missing in Hawke's Bay. And I thought, you know, it would be a great opportunity to bring to our kids. And I knew the challenge wasn't going to be easy because we don't have these programs in Hawke's Bay. Where in Auckland, there's so many opportunities that kids can go into these spaces and gain experience. One of Ms. Kayo's primary goals was to foster unity among youth in Hastings and Napier. Kata Akiong, a student participating in this year's academy, asserts that it has brought them much closer. Napier and Hastings kind of have a rival um, between schools, but um, as we came together as one, and uh, we have made really good friendships with them and definitely are not rivals anymore. Ms. Kayo, the Rainbow Support Leader at Mapumaya at the Hawke's Bay office, is determined to advocate for mental health. She believes that dance, culture and arts are effective ways of demystifying mental health issues. Growing up, the subject was not talked about often, but she says she's now dedicated to making a difference. To be honest, I've only heard of mental health when I came to New Zealand. And as sad as that sounds, it was never introduced into our home. I started gaining more knowledge and understanding of mental health. Despite numerous challenges, Ms. Kayo is unwavering in her mission to dispel misconceptions about the Fafafine community. She says they're still misunderstood. Being back in Samoa, we celebrated and that's because we have a, a sense of belonging in Samoa. But you know, it's a different story when they get to, to, to know us, to sit down and have a chat with us. You know, they have a different view once they they come into our space and, and allow us into their space. Mr. Akiong successfully overcame the very barriers Ms. Kayo highlighted and considers himself privileged to have received her guidance through this academy. Um, at times people can look at them different, but we all respected Annie and what she was able to teach through the academy. There were others that didn't want to join. I was able to influence them to be a part of it. It was just a huge success for us. The project received support from Mapumaya and the National Pacifica Mental Health and Addiction Services in New Zealand. Mr Herman Akiong, the Mapumaya Hawke's Bay lead, says the project is a success. And as they became closer and got to see Annie in, in their natural element, they just opened up and, and that's where the, well, I guess you could say the magic really happened. And it was key for our youth because over the years we've seen a division amongst our Pacific communities and bringing them together and breaking down those barriers and just them identifying with each other that they do go through the, the same struggles. Looking ahead, Miss Kyle reflects on her time as Miss Fafafine. It's been an amazing journey. I can definitely say, you know, it's not an easy journey. It's not for the weak, but with the hearts that we have to, to work for our community, we are able to deliver, and that has been my goal for, for this year. That's Pacific Waves for today. For all episodes, head over to rnz.co.nz forward slash Pacific. We're also on Spotify, Apple and iHeartRadio. From myself and the RNZ Pacific team, tofa sui